Okay, tonight we are reading Zack Power Mind Games. Chapter 1 One afternoon, Zack Power was shopping for cool new sneakers at the Westbridge Mall. Zack was a bit of an expert on the subject of being cool. He was 12 years old and he worked as a spy for the Government Investigation Bureau, or GIB for short. As he shopped, Zack watched out for people he knew. He didn't want anyone from school to think he cared how he looked. That would be too, that would be try hard. At Hot Diggity, the hot dog shop, Anne and her best friend Lucy were giggling into their milkshakes. Girls. His favourite CD shop, Tunes, was full of kids from school. The whole world seemed to be hanging out at Westbridge, but Zack slipped by them all unnoticed. Zack headed towards Sports Station. Inside, the music was so loud the walls were shaking. It was rock music, the only kind Zack liked. Sports Station had the best sneakers at Westbridge. Zack's favourites were a pair with green and yellow stripes on the side. Zack picked them up. Straight away, a sales guy bounced over. A plastic name tag on a cord around his neck read, Davo. You right, mate? asked Davo. Can I try these, uh, size uh, 8? Zack said. No worries, I'll go check out the back. The sales guy disappeared into the storeroom. Zack waited. He looked at some t-shirts. No sales assistant. He picked up a magazine and checked out the photos of kids skateboarding down a stair rail in the latest clothes. Still no Davo. What is he doing out there? Suddenly, Davo reappeared, a shoebox in his hand and a weird look on his face. Mm. <clears throat> we didn't have size 8 in the green and yellow, but why don't you try these? He opened the box. Inside, Zack saw a pair of the ugliest sneakers ever. They were grey, the colour of belly button fluff. The soles were twice as thick as ordinary sneakers. They were covered in wires and flashing lights. Nah, that's okay, thanks, said Zack, heading for the door. Come on, they're a limited edition. I guarantee no one else will have a pair like them. Zack rolled his eyes. No one would want to. Davo pulled the grey sneakers out of the box. Just try them. Heaving a big sigh, Zack grabbed the shoes and pulled them on. They felt even worse than they looked. As soon as his foot was inside, clamps grabbed Zack's ankles. He stood up and couldn't help wobbling as he took a step. Mm. Each sneaker must have weighed about a hundred kilos. What do you think? asked Davo. Zack shook his head. I might wait till you get the others in. Oh, come on, Zack, just take them. Zack? How did this guy know his name? Davo leant over to pick up the box. His name tag flipped over and Zack caught a glimpse of the back. Was it? Yes, it was. The G.I.B. Crest. Davo grabbed Zack by the arm and whispered in his ear, They're yours, okay? Now get out of here. Before Zack could stop him, Davo disappeared with Zack's old sneakers. Great. Now Zack had to walk all the way home in the weird grey sneakers. He stepped out of sports station. Anne and Lucy had finished their milkshakes and had gone home. Perhaps he was safe. Then, kaboom! There was an ear-splitting explosion. A cloud of white smoke. The gross grey sneakers had exploded. Zack shot up off the ground. He flew through the air, propelled by his exploding sneakers. They had the force of ten rockets. No, make that one hundred rockets. Zack shot past hot diggity. Tunes was a blur. He was flying towards a set of lifts. Mm. The metal doors were closed. Yikes! He was going to smash right into them. At the very last second, the lift doors opened and suddenly Zack was falling. He looked up and saw the lift stuck high above him. He was falling straight down the lift well. Round and round, faster and faster, he fell in mid in a mid-air forward roll. At the bottom of the lift well, Zack landed with a thud on hard, cold concrete. Lucky he had been taught how to land safely during GIB training, or he would have broken a bone for sure. The lift doors opened with a ping. Zack was in an underground car park. Parked nearby was a white van with a satellite dish on the top. 
door opened and a strong pair of arms dragged Zack into the back. The door slammed shut and with a screech of tyres, the van took off. Zack looked down at his feet. The exploding sneakers were completely gone. All that was left was a very holy, smoky pair of socks. Hello, Zack, said the strong-armed man who was driving the van. I've been expecting you. Chapter 2 I'm Agent in Training Gorman, GIB Transport Division, said the man. Hope that wasn't too uncomfortable, Zack, he went on, looking guiltily at Zack's socks. I've just transferred from stationery and supplies, actually. You're my first agent pickup. Zack remembered his first solo mission. He smiled at Gorman. It wasn't easy being the new guy. Do you know the way to the airport, Zack? asked Gorman. The airport? Why? What's my mission? said Zack. Gorman fished around in his pockets. It's somewhere in here, muttered Gorman to himself. At last he found what he was looking for. He handed Zack a small metal disc. Zack loaded the disc into his spy pad. Every GIB spy had a spy pad. It looked sort of like an electronic game, but really it was a mini computer with built-in GPS navigation software. Laser and Codebreaker all rolled into one. Classified. Mission initiated 9 a.m. Unknown hostilities are hacking into the computer system controlling World Eye. World Eye is GIB's satellite system. So powerful it can read a newspaper headline from 500 kilometers up. The software is protected by encrypted passwords and high-level firewalls. Still, the hackers have managed to breach every firewall but one. Your mission, locate hackers, discover what they want to hack was to discover why they want to hack into World Eye. Prevent breaching of final firewall. End. This was bad. Only one for firewall standing between World Eye and a bunch of criminals. What does Leon think? asked Zack as the van turned into the freeway to the airport. Leon, Zack's brother, was a technical support officer at GIB. If anyone knew how to handle computer hackers, it was Leon. Leon's... Leon's tracked the hackers to the city of Bladesville, said Gorman. Zack fought back a proud smile. Sometimes nerdy brothers really do come in handy. You wouldn't be smiling if you knew anything about Bladesville, said Gorman. His eyes widened. I've heard it's one of the meanest, toughest, dirtiest cities in the whole world. Zack said nothing. Whatever Bladesville had in store for him, he could deal with it, couldn't he? Oh yeah, Gorman went on. Leon reckons it'll take the hackers 24 hours to breach the last firewall. Only 24 hours? Zack did some quick calculations in his head. Now he was freaking out. Says here the mission started at 9am today, so that means I've only got until 9am tomorrow to fly to Bladesville and stop the hackers. And that's... Zack glanced at his watch. It's already 6.51pm. Gordon looked guiltily, guilty for a moment. Yeah, sorry about the delay in getting you on the mission, Zack. First time in everything, you see. Gorman coughed nervously, but Zack could see there wasn't any point getting angry. Gorman was doing the best he could. Was it his fault? His best was, um, not really very good. Gorman opened the van's glove box. I nearly forgot these, he said, passing... Passing Zack a pair of wraparound glasses with a computer game controller attached. Those aren't going to explode too, are they? Zack asked, thinking of the grey sneakers. No, they're virtual reality glasses, said Gorman vaguely. Zack put the glasses on. It looked exactly like he was sitting in the cockpit of a fighter jet. Zack grabbed the controller. On screen, it looked like he was touching real fighter jet controls. Whoa, said Zack. It was the most realistic virtual reality flight simulator ever. Isn't it incredible, said Gorman? Ever piloted a fighter jet before? Zack hadn't, but he couldn't wait to try. He took hold of the steering yoke. He sped off down the tarmac. He engaged the throttle. Then, with a loud, realistic whoosh of air, he was airborne. Up Zack flew. He burst through the clouds. He was 20,000 feet and climbing. He fiddled with the controls. One was for speed. One was to turn left and right. This flying thing doesn't look so hard, thought Zack. Then Zack heard a warning siren. A message flashed on his virtual computer screen. Storm alert! The sky went dark. Purple lightning slashed the sky. The plane shook violently. Zack's fighter had been struck. The fighter jerked one way, then the other. Zack couldn't get control of the steering. He, his computer flashed, screen flashed again. Losing altitude. The plane nosedived. Helpless, Zack watched the altitude drop from 20,000 to 10,000 feet in a few seconds. He broke through the clouds. Right below was a mountain range. He was going to crash. Zack braced himself for impact. 
The fighter spun onto its back and slammed into the mountains. It burst into flames. Game over. You lose. Zack ripped off the virtual reality glasses. He was sweating. The plane crash had felt so real. All right, Zack, us Gorman, computer games are so advanced these days and so addictive, they really play mind games with you. Ghost White, Zack nodded. Well, don't worry, we're at the airport now, said Gorman cheerfully. The van turned into a secret side entrance. The tarmac was just ahead, and there waiting for Zack was a miniature fighter jet. Probably should have told you before, said Gorman, absent mindedly. You're flying yourself to Bladesville. The flight simulator was your training. Zack said nothing. A spy always keeps his cool. That's okay with you, isn't it, Zack? Oh, no. Chapter 3 Zack strode casually across the tarmac towards the mini fighter jet. He raced up the stairs to the cockpit. The controls looked almost the same as the ones in the flight simulator. A radio headset sat on the pilot seat. Zack put it on and heard a voice. Zack Power, this is air traffic control. The time is 8.09pm. Weather conditions? Fine. You're cleared to take off on the runway 3. Zack took hold of the yoke. He engaged the throttle and the engine growled. The fighter jet taxied across the tarmac. Zack angled the yoke upwards and pushed harder on the throttle. The jet gathered speed. Then, with a loud thump, as the wheels folded up, Zack was in the air. But this time it was for real. Steadily, Zack climbed. He pierced the clouds. The sun was out and there was no wind. Perfect flying conditions. Zack tipped the yoke forward. The plane dipped down. He pulled the yoke up again. The plane shot upwards. He pulled the yoke sharp right. The jet flipped over onto its side. Cool. Zack tried the left-hand side. He shot into a wicked loop-the-loop. Maybe this was, wasn't getting him to Bladesville as fast as possible, but it was so worth it. A voice crackled in Zack's radio headset. Come in, Zack Power. Power here, said Zack as confidently as he could. Weather conditions in your airspace have declined, said air traffic control. A freak electrical storm's heading your way. Zack looked around. The brilliant sunshine had gone. Heavy black clouds were everywhere. The fighter started to rattle and bump. Turbulence. Suggest emergency landing, said air traffic control. Zack looked at his watch. 10.49pm. If Zack landed now, it'd take him forever to get to Bladesville and find those hackers. Freak storm or not, Zack was going to have to keep flying. Request permission to continue to Bladesville, said Zack. There was silence from air traffic control. The fighter roared into a really rough air pocket. The entire cockpit shook. For a second, radio communication dropped out. The radio came back on. Permission granted. Proceed at your own risk. Grimly, Zack flew on. Wind rattled the windscreen. The plane lifted and dropped in the wind. It was worse than a fun park ride. The fighter was equipped with rocket-assisted ejector seats. Zack checked where the lever was, just in case. Beside the lever, Zack noticed a button labelled Vertical Supersonic. Zack took a deep breath. Could this button possibly do what he hoped? If it climbed at supersonic speed, there was a chance Zack would make it above the storm and out of danger. Just then, the cockpit lit up as lightning crackled across the sky. These were the conditions that made Zack crash the simulator. Without thinking, Zack slammed his hand down on the Vertical Supersonic the vertical supersonic button. Oops. Immediately, the flighter jet responded. The nose rose steeply until the plane was speeding straight up. Then, boom! A sonic boom. Zack had broken the speed of sound. He'd gone supersonic. He streaked upwards, leaving the storm behind him. His hands shook. Going vertical supersonic had been as scary as it was awesome. Dun, dun, dun.